Hello, everyone. Welcome to another capsule, IR capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. One of the biggest events of the century, you could say, is the Communist Party uh, Central Committee's meeting in uh, Beijing, which started on the 6th. I said century because this is an unprecedented situation where the leader of the Communist Party is, and the president, getting an unprecedented third term. Of course, uh, President Mao, or Chairman Mao, as he was known, he continued for many years from the revolution till his uh, demise. But after that, a term was fixed for Chinese presidents. That is two terms maximum. And this is the first time after that constitutional amendment, Xi Jinping is being given a third term. This was expected. We had known this for a long time. Of course, there was in between some rumors of a coup, and some people said that he was in jail after his trip to Samarkand. But all that turned out to be wishful thinking. And uh, although he left Beijing after the pandemic for the first time, there was no threat to uh, his presidency. All that was the, the just rumors. <clears throat> so on the 6th, we saw him addressing the, uh, the uh, Congress, 20th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, with uh, all the delegates properly uh, present. And uh, we could see that he is the commander in chief of everything, the military, the civilian, the government, the party, everything. All this will be formalized only on the 23rd, when the Congress ends. But um, this has become uh, the only leader before him who was unquestioned like that was Mao. After that, there were uh, several uh, leaders, but uh, there was a certain amount of collective leadership and some of them are more prominent than the others. I'm not going into all those uh, details. But um, Mao, the great henchman, he was called, and he continued till 1976. Then 1977, Deng Xiaoping, he proposed uh, collective leadership. And after that, there were uh, three or four presidents. And uh, then Xi Jinping, who became president 10 years ago. And um, of course, the background was that he was an elitist kind of Communist Party family. Uh, but then he opted uh, to work in the villages, in the communes, and so on. And he built himself up as a leader and came back to, uh, back to Beijing. And he rose in the uh, Politburo, became the, the president, and all the official positions, military commission, uh, the party general secretary and the president. So all these positions he, he held. And uh, unlike the other leaders who have all these two term limitations, in his case, that limitation was lifted by, the, uh, by an amendment of the constitution. So it was very clear that this was done for the president to give him a third term. And the formality of it will happen on the uh, 23rd. Uh, but now the whole Congress of this one week has already been choreographed. What it will discuss, what decisions will be taken has all been decided by the leader who may also be designated as a chairman. The only other chairman that um, China had was Mao Zedong. And therefore, he is going to be the second chairman if he is designated as chairman of the party. And, and the, of course, the Mao was called the helmsman. That was specially for him. Uh, but some designation like that might be given to him. And there's a general feeling that he may continue, not only for the next five years, and maybe another five years, he may become president for life, because there is no restriction on, on tenure. So after he became president, he uh, decided to give up the collective leadership and it took on the reins of the government in his own hands. 
And um, there was a Politburo Static Committee of seven members, which used to take all the major decisions. So he downgraded the Standing Committee of the Politburo. And uh, he started depending only on the 25 member Politburo, so which was bigger. And uh, the cabinet, the, there was a cabinet, but its importance was also you know, reduced. So in 2017, uh, he was designated as the core leader. So another promotion he got in 2017. And then Xi Jinping thought on socialism uh, with uh, characteristics, special characteristics, Chinese characteristics. And that became, again, something like Mao, that like Mao's thoughts, the Red Book, etc. So he was being elevated from one level to the other. And uh, so he took control of the party, the government, the civilian life, the military, and the academic works. So all this he put into his own hands. And uh, there was no protest, or if there was protest, probably we don't know about that, what happens to protesters. Uh, but he was able to overcome whatever opposition there was. And it was in 2018 that National People's Congress amended the constitution to remove the term limit for the president. So there was uh, no opposition to all this. And then COVID came, we had an absolute authority to deal, deal with this. And um, then he moved against the privatization to a great extent. He started talking about socialism, but common prosperity for all. So in a sense that the, the unbridled capitalism, which was prevalent there of major private companies, uh, land holdings, um, very many big uh, billionaires lost their money and some of them went to jail. And so he said, not just not capitalism, that was adopted after 1972, uh, but a new kind of socialism and common prosperity for all, in the sense that too much of uh, wealth cannot be accumulated by individuals. And uh, he gave indications that he will go back to communism and socialism with the characteristics, with the special characteristics of China. So 10 years of Xi's rule, was a glorified, a glorious decade, leader-centric, propaganda, complete sway over the government. And therefore, it was expected uh, that he would uh, formalize his leadership at this particular uh, party congress. So though the congress is still continuing and decisions we will know only later, the indication that we get from the speech he made on the first day. And that is what the world is analyzing. Everybody is analyzing, reading every word of it and trying to figure out what his policies will be. It's been pointed out that this speech was mainly to his own people and not to the world, but the world, world seems to be analyzing it and trying to figure out what kind of policies he will follow. He did not mention any country in these speeches in the speech, but uh, that is not uh, customary to name other countries in the party speech, and therefore no country is mentioned, uh, but um, it's obvious who, they, who he means when he uses certain uh, expressions. So he laid out a decade-long vision. So he is not thinking only of uh, five years, but maybe uh, 10 years. And uh, though he was opti optimistic that uh, this will all work out, but unlike in the previous speech, which he made in uh, 19, sorry, 2017, um, he mentioned many hurdles and problems that may come in the way. So in a way, warning his people that uh, it, the next 10 years may not be as easy as the last 10 years, because there are developments abroad and there are crisis abroad and therefore he was preparing his people to have a to prepare themselves 
uh, for a difficult time ahead. But he committed himself to boost in China's economic and military strength. All these words have been analyzed by people what it means. Boost in China's economic and military strength. Self-reliance um, in science and technology. Then he warned of external threats, which he did not do last time. He didn't say who the external threats were, but he warned of external threats increasingly turbulent world. So he attributed the difficulties that China may face in the future. Uh, he could being optimistic at the same time, he mentioned some of the difficulties that may happen. But uh, his vision of 2035, so he looks up to, up to that period, and uh, he says, I'm quoting him, he said, in the, by 2035, he'll significantly increase economic strength, scientific and technological capabilities, and, and comprehensive, national, comprehensive national strength. So national strength will be increased, and uh, as elements of it, economic strength, scientific and technological capabilities, and a comprehensive national strength is what he has promised. Then he said that China will join the most innovative countries with great self-reliance and strength in science and technology. So strengthen national security. So every aspect, technology, science, economy, military, strengthen national security and achieve basic modernization of the armed forces. So all this lays out a plan, which is a very ambitious plan. He speaks about differences, he speaks about difficulties, but he has laid out this vision as something that he proposes to accomplish during his next term and probably another term. And that was the general layout of the situation that he, he presented. So no country was mentioned, but we know that he is referring to the United States. And then later he referred to neighborhood. There was probably there is some reference to Pakistan, reference to India, etc. But no country was mentioned, but he expected difficulties. But the most important issue that he addressed was Taiwan. And that was very significant because their policy, Chinese policy, is that there is only one China and that it has to be unified. Taiwan has to be reunited with China. And the only new thing that he said was China would never promise to renounce the use of force. So he put it negatively in the sense that he did not say we'll use a force. So he said, we will not, China would never promise to renounce the use of force. In other words, we are willing to use of force if necessary, which was directed solely at uh, interference from outside, he said, external forces. Although Beijing would continue to strive for peaceful reunification. So when he said there are problems about reunification, he did not attribute it to the people in China or in Taiwan, but to the external forces. And we know who the external forces are, definitely the United States. So resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete uh, reunification is, for the party, a historic mission and an unshakable commitment. The wheels of history are rolling on towards China's reunification and the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Very significant statement. Because it's a historic mission, unshakable commitment. All these words are very meaningful, very loaded. And the wheels of history are rolling. So obviously he has some date in mind. Till then, he may wait, but after that, you cannot stop it. And therefore there will be reunification and rejuvenation. He kept repeating this, that we were successful in the last 10 years, but next 10 years will be even more successful. So he kept referring to strong defense of the decade and rejuvenation of the party and the country. And his reference to uh, neighbors, he said that he wants enhanced friendly ties, mutual interest, and uh, converging interests with the neighbors. So 
kind of peaceful policy towards neighbors. We will enhance the military strategic capabilities for defending Chinese sovereignty, security, and development interests. So that's a warning to the neighbors like India, that we will enhance the military strategic capabilities for defending Chinese sovereignty, security, and development interests. So we are talking about the about uh, Xi Jinping's uh, assessment of the global situation, and he said that the world was in a flux, and uh, there is a backlash against uh, globalization. There is a tendency towards unilateralism and protectionism are mounting, and uh, formation of blocks to refer to. Of course, he didn't speak about the Quad by name. Uh, but he has that in mind, obviously, opposes the forming of blocks and exclusive groups that forget a particular countries against particular countries or forgetting the particular countries. So that is the his assessment as far as the world is concerned. So he mentioned the dangers globally and also talked about a new um, new new world order which is emerging. And uh, he placed himself right in the middle of it. And though he hinted at these difficulties, he promised his people a prosperous uh, time ahead. Then there was a, one particular uh, event during the Congress on the first day, which has hurt India uh, because they showed a documentary of, um, of Galwan, it's a, it's a man called Ki Fabao, Commander Ki Fabao, who was brought into the party congress. How he came, we don't know. So he attended the meeting, not only that, he was shown in Galwan fighting against Indian soldiers. So this was how he was included and why it was done at a time when there is tension between India and China, it's obvious. So they wanted to get some publicity for that. And uh, as you know, it's a politically significant move at a time when uh, we are still remembering what happened in Galvan. We lost 20 soldiers. Chinese also lost soldiers, but we don't know how many. But the hero of Galvan was exhibited at the Congress. Of course, India was not referred to, but we know that out of the five points of um, this designation is taken in friction points in five places, uh, but still there are two more places remaining uh, engaged, not disengaged yet. And um, you know there is criticism that India has conceded uh, land to the Chinese, so it's a complicated matter. But without referring to this particular incident, uh, he was exhibited there, like uh, like for the Olympics, also. A soldier was uh, found marching, showing as a Galvan hero. So this is disturbing for India, but at the same time, he did not acknowledge the country, but this was uh, a friction point for us, as far as the party Congress is concerned. So, so what's going to happen is that uh, after Mao's uh, reign until 1977, here is a leader who is aiming higher than Mao Zedong. And uh, he is assuming all the authorities, that uh, authority that uh, Mao had in a modern world, in a modern sense. So he, he, he said that there was a shift in Chinese economy and uh, he was dealing with these problems. And he talked about China needs self-reliance like our Atmanar Bar also, and um, a global competition and uh, for in order to succeed. So he mentioned the need for us to compete with other countries. And another indication was that uh, he was going to increase the birth rate. As you know, China had restricted, uh, you know, one child formula of family could have more than one child that they say to two children. And now we feel that the population is, uh, is thinning out and therefore they won't have more 
uh, more children and uh, aging population and so they want a young generation also so he is he is going to suggest that uh, there will be no control over family planning as such then uh, the whole thing is clearly that he is looking at the words that he used was he was looking at a great power status for china and uh, of course there was no reference to united states directly but he talked about the conflict with great powers in order to um, you know assume greater authority uh, for himself so what you are seeing from this speech of course it, it has so many elements it's very difficult for us to cover all this in a short time uh, but this will be studied for a long time it was a two hour speech and i just picked up some of the some of the points so what is unmistakable is that he is aiming to be higher than mao what the status that will be we don't know uh, but um, china has become much stronger and therefore he uh, felt that he must brief his people what the next 5 years would be and since there is no free press in china everybody will read his speech with great interest because that is the only source you can get of what um, he has achieved so he actually reported the big things that he has achieved in the last uh, 10 years and um, uh, he indicated very clearly that he is ready to fight for its position and uh, there but though there are risks and challenges so the last years were difficult but uh, we succeeded and we have to face up to new challenges so that is the real essence of what he said and uh, all these all these decisions that will be uh, taken during the congress will definitely be online with what he had stated so it placed it placed the issues before the people and the structural reforms necessary and um, how he will uh, fight hegemony and uh, group policies and uh, china demanded uh, supply chains maintenance of supply chains that is where they are very strong so the message was that he is on top of all issues including and by one and of course he didn't speak about uh, uh, about uh, russia or ukraine relationship with russia etc was not mentioned and what is it that we have to learn from it and that is something that our experts are studying at the moment so we should be aware of the fact that uh, india china status quo of a difficult relationship is continuing how is he going to deal with it how is he going to uh, uh, develop trade with india all this remain to be seen so authority and power is virtually seeking that what he is saying is that if you give me the authority for the next 5 years or 10 years these are the things that he will accomplish and uh, i'm sure the members of the congress must be commenting on them all all of them must be praising him for all this and that we will all know at the end and there will be some decisions taken so in other words what i was trying to do was that the congress itself we will have to study once it is over but this speech alone will give us an idea of what xi jinping is planning to do and the uh, news to us is that we have to be prepared Uh, for a strong and powerful china next door to us and that will be a long term problem for india and we need to work on various aspects you have to decide on your friends you have to decide on what kind of relationship with you are you are with the united states because if china grows from strength to strength and russia is with them we need to fortify ourselves with good friends elsewhere and we do it very carefully systematically and we are also determined just like the chinese leadership so that way there is something common we also have a, a vision of a glorious india our prime minister also talking about 50 years now this is the 75th year when the 100th year comes what india would be so that kind of a vision india also has and here not a democratic leader he does not have to seek re-election 
So he has a better chance of implementing his vision. Uh, but then in a system like that, how much can he deliver? And what will be the nature of the situation when he finishes his five-year term? All these remain unclear. Uh, but you may like to note all these points about the speeches and then relate it to the developments, the conclusions of the conference. And um, you can be sure of some questions being asked in your examination on this very significant event. And therefore, I suggest that you, you read the speech and uh, understand the implications of it. There are plenty of analysis available. As many experts there are, there are analysis available. And uh, you must have a comprehensive understanding of the things to be expected from Xi Jinping's uh, third term. Thank you. <laughs>